Okay, everybody, welcome to our Come Follow Me discussion this week. A little historical context. This week is Helaman 13 through 16. And it may be the shortest historical context yet because it only covers a very, very short uh, time period and really one story. So it begins in the 86th year of the reign of the judges. We're about six years before the birth of the Savior, uh, approximately. A little background. Uh, we, we don't know who the chief judge is because at this time the government is in a very corrupt state that the, uh, the righteous people have been removed. The evil people are and their secret combinations have been infested the government. They control that. So we, they don't even list the name of the chief judge at this time. We know that Nephi is the prophet. But he leaves the capital city to go out and preach in the neighboring communities. We know that he came back. And when he came back, he saw the wickedness of the capital city and went and prayed upon his tower. So here's a story that takes place at this time as well. It's Samuel the Lamanite. It's interesting that they need somebody from south of the border to come over and declare repentance unto their people. And the question is, who's humble enough to allow a foreigner in to preach repentance unto you? I hope we are. Uh, I really hope we are. I, I love that. With all humor, uh, Elder Suarez, we have an apostle who's from south of our border, and uh, he's a great individual. I hope we listen to him and uh, reverence and respect the great words that he shares. But anyway, these people are not in a, in a mindset to let, uh, in their minds, an inferior person, uh, someone who's a Lamanite, to come and share the message with them. So what does Samuel do after he preaches? Well, he leaves. In verse 2, this is chapter 13, Helaman chapter 13. In verse 2, after just a couple of days there, well, it says many days he preaches, he's cast out of the city. So he leaves. He's going back home. But verse 3, the voice of the Lord came unto him that he should return again and prophesy unto the people whatsoever thing should come into his heart. In other words, I'm not going to tell you what to say until you're there, and then I'll put it in your heart. You'll just have feelings, and you'll say, you'll know what to say. Do we have that much faith to when we give a talk, and maybe in sacrament meeting? That, I mean, do we have to write down every single word like we're a general conference speaker and we think we have that much power in our words? We really don't. Do we have enough faith that we could prepare our hearts and our thoughts and our minds, find some things that we feel maybe on the topic we're assigned to share? But when we stand up, let our heart be full of those things that we have been studying and let the Spirit tell us what to say and have enough faith in him. Now, that takes faith, but I, I believe we can do that. And in all honesty, they're the best talks in sacrament meeting and maybe in other classes that we have in the church where we, we share what's in our heart. So I think there's a, a great uh, lesson we can learn there. Verse 4, they would not suffer that he should enter into the city. Now, again, a little background here. Remember, the Nephites have fortified their city. We read in the book of Alma how they fortified their cities. They built walls. They dug ditches. Uh, they put uh, gates up. Well, these well-fortified cities now are prohibiting the Samuel to enter the city because they locked him out. So what does he do? Gets up on the wall. How they got up there? I have no idea. Did he build a ladder? Did he climb a tree? I don't know. Somehow he got up on the wall and he's going to preach. And he lets him have it. This is a great uh, discussion to read and study and say, okay, what is he saying? Verse 7, there's a little bit more information we hear about Samuel the Lamanite. That it's an angel of the Lord that told him what to say. And it's, and it's a, the message, notice, it's not dark and depressing. It's in verse 7, glad tidings to my soul. The gospel should be a joyful message, not gloom and doom. If it's gloom and doom, we're looking at it from the wrong angle. But there is a message. Uh, verse 8, except they, the Nephites, repent, I will take away my word from them, and I will withdraw my spirit from them. 
really, that's the consequence. If there's a punishment for sin, it's the spirit leaps. And uh, we don't have that guidance. Now, he's going to prophesy in verse 9 that 400 years will pass away and the Nephites won't have the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know how many people are afraid of, oh my, 400 years from now, is that my punishment? They, they don't even worry about it. But he's really prophesying to them and their future generations. Verse 10, I will visit them in my fierce anger. In my fierce anger. But 11 is always the catch-all. If you repent, if you just turn your heart unto me, you come back, uh, then you'll be blessed, you'll be happy, and so forth. So there's some great things. Uh, verse 13 might be the theme in the scriptures. Blessed are they who will repent. We just hear that message over and over and over. Oh, and he talks about cursing of riches. You can't have your riches. they will curse. Boy, could you imagine if your money was cursed? It wouldn't even do you the good that you were hoping it was going to do. But let's move on to the next little bit here. Chapter 14 are the prophecies, the predictions that Samuel will make about the sign of the birth of the Savior of the world is light. It's stars in the heaven. It's light. No wonder that the sign of the birth will be light. So what is the sign of his death? Darkness. Three days of darkness, it says here. Well, one thing that's a little interesting to look at here is how the church, excuse me, how the uh, world, the earth, the physical earth changed at the, uh, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. If you go to Helaman in chapter 14, verse 21, it says, Yea, at the time that he shall yield up the ghost, there shall be thunderings and lightnings for the space of many hours, and the earth shall shake and tremble. So the earth is physically going to shake and tremble. And the rocks which are upon the face of the earth, which are both above the earth and beneath. So we're talking inside the earth and on the earth. At which, which ye know at this time are solid. Or the more part of it is one solid mass. Shall be broken up. Now, I am not a physical scientist by any means. But it is interesting. If I wanted to age the earth or do the dating of the earth or understand the, the earth's structure. Somehow in here, Samuel says that the earth was more of a one solid mass. I'm not saying it's all one continent. We know it's separated by this time. Nephi showed us that, right? But the rock, the earth itself, is more part of it is a solid mass. But at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we now have rocks broken up into smaller pieces. So I have a, a, a dear friend of mine who says every time he's in his garden and he finds a rock, he just looks at it and says, yep, the atonement's real. Here's my, here's my token that the atonement is real. It's a broken piece of rock in my garden. So take that for what you will, and you can have a little bit of uh, fun studying that little principle in here. Now, 15, uh, again, it's the same story. Samuel's teaching the repentance. Uh, and here he's going to the family. I think inter ver interesting verses, Helaman 15, verse 2, except you repent, your women shall have great cause to mourn. So it's like, I'm going to warn you, if you're not enough, I'm, your family's going to be uh, affected. I, I think there's truth with that. If a man doesn't repent, I think his wife and children suffer. Th think about that for a moment. If a man is committing sin, how does he suffer? I I've known, I I've had to tell men that because of their actions, they can't baptize their own kid or they can't give a blessing as a father. Uh, those are just some, some things that are real easy to illustrate. But think about that for a moment. How can the consequence of a parent 
affect their children because a lot of people think I can do what I want and, and it doesn't affect the kids. They'll be fine. No, that's not true. Uh, I think it's interesting here is in chapter 15, still verse 12, it says, I say unto you that in the latter days, the promises of the Lord have been extended to our brethren, the Lamanites, and notwithstanding the many afflictions which they shall have, and notwithstanding they shall be driven to and fro upon the face of the earth, and be hunted, and shall be smitten, and scattered abroad, having no place for refuge. The Lord shall be merciful unto them. Uh, even though these people have, will do and are doing some horrible things here, in the long run, the Lord's merciful to us. I, I just think there's power in that. A again, it's definitely a... a uh, a, a true principle of the gospel. Now, let's end with chapter 16. Here's something that I find interesting. Samuel preaches to all of these people, but he doesn't baptize them. Chapter 15, excuse me, chapter 16, verse 1. As many as believed on his word went forth and sought for Nephi. And when they had come forth and found him, they confessed unto him their sins. Notice, Nephi is their local priesthood leader. Samuel's not taking the glory or the baptisms. He's not even taking confessions. That's, a, that's Nephi's responsibility. Samuel just uh, gives him, uh, leads him in the right direction. So think of that as missionaries. How many times have you heard stories where someone's like, well, I taught and I taught and I taught, but I got transferred out of the area, or I was home before somebody finally was baptized. I didn't get to enjoy that baptism. Or sometimes it's the opposite. Uh, a missionary steps into an area brand new, and there's five people there ready to get baptized. Why? Because some other missionary previously did all the work. So think about this for a moment. Nephi, who had all of that missionary time before to preach the gospel here and abroad and, and the other communities outside of the capital, but it's not until now, as Samuel's preaching, that there seems to be this group of people that want to be baptized. And they do. That's verses 1 and 2. And then uh, verse 1, they get baptized. Verse 2, Samuel gets kicked off the wall. Uh, for divine uh, intervention, he uh, gets protected. So where does he go? It says in here, well, most of them don't believe. There's just a few. He jumps off his wall. Then in verse 8, he's never heard of more by the Nephites. Again, I've heard some wonderful speculation at six years before the birth of the Savior. Where does he go? Well, in here, it says that he went back to the Lamanites and uh, taught amongst his own people. So, some great things. Now, verse 14, angels did appear unto men wise men, and did declare unto them glad tidings of great joy. So we have a clear split amongst the Nephites. There is a group that are being righteous, and angels are ministering unto them. What a glorious, glorious circumstance. But at the same time, it's corrupt. The government is doing horrible things. We'll see in the next week that it will split up. We'll see cities get destroyed. We're going to see some things that when you watch the evening news this week, you can read the same thing in 3 Nephi. So for next week, we will discuss 3 Nephi chapters 1 through 7, and I'll see you then.